Joe came that early April morning at an air base in Colorado. Forty flying fortresses line the apron. Four thousand men march out for a final inspection. They've trained long and hard with these ships. The 400 men who fly them and the 3,600 who work to keep them flying. Now the 351st Bombardment Group is ready. By the dawn's early light, it assembles for overseas combat. You're on your way, Joe. This is it. With his staff, Colonel William A. Hatchie, Jr. looks over his four squadrons. You feel the old man is proud of you. He finds no fault with you today, nor you with him. You'd fly his wing to hell and gone. Sergeant Philip J. Halls, top turret gunner from Springfield, Missouri. He feels that way. So does his pal Kenny, Sergeant Kenneth L. Halls, ball turret gunner from Perkins, Oklahoma. Related? No. They think they might have been several generations ago back in Germany, but now, just two guys with the same uncle, Sam. Meet their pilot, Lieutenant Theodore Argeropoulos of Redding, California. Arge's brother is in the Air Corps, too. Their dad was born in Greece. Yes, the Greeks have a word for it. Fight. Their bombardier, Lieutenant Daniel F. Stevens of Chicago. He can bat a thousand with a Norton bomb sight. Sergeant Paul J. Posty, Paul Terry Gunner. His dad came from Italy. Paul was formerly a pastry cook. He's got one brother in the Navy. Another, a Marine, missing in action. Here's Sergeant Tim Touchett, tail gunner from Mariana Lake, New Mexico. On the reservation, they named him Aki. That means boy in Navajo. Uncle Sam's boy, too. A few last minute instructions, and we're off. The compass points northeast. Take another look down there. That's your part of the earth. Out of that desert, those mountains, those fields has grown the American way of life. What you're fighting for. You remember the Colonel's quiet words? Men, the enemy has asked for it. Let him have it. Seek no quarter, nor give any beyond reason. Be firm, be just, and Godspeed you all. Eight and a half hours out of Newfoundland, another sunrise. It's rising out of the red of battle, this sun. But 40 more B-17s, three minutes apart, have roared across the Atlantic night. The Irish coast looks up to say, top of the morning. And a lake in the Ulster Highlands gives the navigator a checkpoint. Off the Scottish coast, Dernia Craig is a signal for right rudder south, across the English Midlands. Pilots are impatient with the lack of sleep. Head up, boy. Pour on the coal. Let's get there. carried swastikas instead of these big white stars. Don't worry, folks. We're dropping nothing today, just our hats in the ring. Hello, Missy. We brought something for you and brother. Chewing gum and chocolate bars. And there's a crate of oranges in the ball turret. Ah, there, Grandpa. We'll be seeing you for a glass of that. And there's the base. 400 acres of dispersal areas. RAF is on hand to welcome us. Set her down, Colonel. Set her down. The 351st becomes part of the 8th Air Force. We've reached the battlefront. The combat crews move into English barracks. They give them those simple, quiet names for which Americans are famous. Two weeks later, the ground crews arrive. Hi, Gus. Great boat trip, huh? Only seven days and without any escort, too, hmm? See any submarines? Oh, a hundred of them, huh? 
Well, I guess you ought to know, Gus. They tell me you was hanging over the rail all the way. Next day, big doings. Class A uniform. Shine those buttons. His Royal Highness, the Duke of Gloucester. Brother to the King of England drops in and is greeted by the old man. What's up? The Sergeant Major says the RAF is handing over the field to us. On behalf of the Air Ministry, I hand over this aerodrome complete with buildings and equipment for your safekeeping. It gives me great pleasure to accept this station on behalf of the United States Army Air Force. RAF, if we can fit your boots, we'll walk it straight, brother. Another surprise visitor, General Arnold himself doing a world inspection flight. He tells you you've got a tough assignment. This is one head man who knows and doesn't kid you. We have the privilege to meet General Laker, commanding general, 8th Air Force. Hi, right, right, sir. Cable. Yeah, glad to see you. How are you coming to this camera training film of yours? Well, it's a little early to tell you, sir. But uh, we're turning a camera on everything and everybody. Well, I know what General Arnold had in mind in having you make this gunnery picture. Captain Gable, our gunners are already the best in the business. But if they were only 10% better, it would cost the Germans another 100 fighters a month. So fire away, gunners. Plenty more practice before that first mission. The sleeve is a fork wolf. Track him. If you don't, he might get you, and you might have to bail out. Over the channel, perhaps. But if you do, a spitfire of the Air Sea Rescue Service is bound to spot you. A stubborn, tough gang, this outfit. They'll go after you any time, any place. They picked up men three miles off the French coast with Heine defense batteries screaming, No, you don't. Their answer is always, Sorry, old boy. We will. You work on your identification of aircraft. Over here, it's with a real McCoy, such as this captured JU-88. It is. Everything up forward, punched under the nose. But the Canadian pilot says it's a sweet flying ship. Yes, sir. A dangerous all-purpose aircraft. Or the Heinkel 111K. Here he's a bad hombre, but he makes good airplanes, gentlemen. These will be a happy sight in days to come. Your fighter escort. That big barrel nose job, circled in white. Your own American P-47, the Thunderbolt. Side by side with a graceful spit. These are what you don't shoot at. You hear daily lectures on security given by Major Scott, your Scotch-born intelligence officer. Let's stop kidding ourselves. This flying field is only 20 minutes from the battlefront. The dumb spies have all been shot. The smart ones are still living. And you may run into one of them tonight at the Red Lion pub. And if you go to the pub... Remember, one pound is not one dollar, but four dollars. And that equals 20 shillings. One shilling equals 12 pennies, which equals 20 cents. One English penny equals two American pennies. And don't throw your pennies around. Uh, Major, it seems to me the paper in this pound is not very durable. 
What do you mean durable? I have had this one for 20 years. <laughs> What is it, Fred? What is it? One of those bitter lessons you learn in training. Flying close formation in rough air at low altitude is no good, gentlemen. Save that for high altitude when you're headed for the target. Next morning, we crawl out of the sack to find Britishers on the field again. Big Halifax bombers that have blasted Berlin during the night. Their own field was closed in by weather, so they dropped in on us for breakfast. Say, uh, Percy, how's the ack ack over there? Rough? Oh, not half bad, ye. Well, chitty old lads. Thanks for the ham and eggs. So long, Percy, old boy. We'll be finding out for ourselves one of these days. That day arrives. The order comes over the teletype. The communications clerk carries it to Colonel Milton, operations officer. To Colonel Burns, deputy commander. The old man is on the phone. Then in the briefing room. I'm summarizing. Remember your route in to this DR point where you go northeast to avoid this black area. P-47. We'll escort you to about this point on the way in, and Spit 9 will meet you about here on the way out and escort you all the way home. And now the weather officer. Weather's plenty important. You'll probably have to go over and above the altitude that you're scheduled to fly, 23,000 feet. From the IP to the target, the winds will be very strong tailwinds, and your ground speed should be well above 200 and 50, 260 miles an hour. The visibility is good everywhere east of that cold front, and the temperature at the target should be comparatively warm, minus 25 degrees centigrade. Today is your baptism of fire. If Lieutenant Argeropoulos...